your source for everything paranormal. Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And once again, Mary Meet, everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a secular look at demons with my guest, Joseph C. Stewart. Now, Joseph has over 50 years of experience as a ghost hunter, 11 years as a demon hunter, and over 50 years investigating UFOs and alien abductions with organizations like APRO and MUFON. And um, after many years of paranormal interest, Joe decided to start sharing a lifetime of his experiences, including demons. Now, if anybody in the chat room um, would like to ask a question or share a comment, please send me a note in private chat. And those of you outside the chat room, you'll have to join us or, um, you know, if you want to share your thoughts or have a question. And we can be found at paraxradionetwork.com. And we've got a whole lot of stuff to do tonight um, and get to tonight. And so, Joseph, I'm bringing you in. Welcome back. Or not welcome back. Welcome. (laughs) Thank you for having me. It's a great book. I mean, you know, and, and like I just mentioned to you a little while ago, um, Red Feather did an amazing job of the book. I mean, both inside and out. The cover is deliciously foreboding. The inside covers are black, and the few black pages at the beginning surely set the tone. So, um, yeah, congratulations on that one. Thank you. <laughs> Not that you'd had a whole lot to do with it, but, but yeah. Um, all right, so... One very important aspect of the book is that you want people to understand that demons are real. So let's begin with the definition of a demon and what is their purpose if they have one? Well, um, I'll just use the term an entity. Uh, We don't know. I do not know the origin, even though there's many religions and cultures that have origin stories. And basically, they are vicious, they are Machiavellian in their actions, they are uh, chaotic, arrogant, egotistical, and they just have a great hatred for mankind, as well as themselves. They will throw each other under the bus if it it suits them. Um, So that's kind of, I basically go by the behavior of them, that's how I would describe them. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying they're very much uh, uh, involved in our life, our lives and cultures, even though we're not aware of them. And uh, when I started doing this, that's when I became aware that um, there's just too many to, to deal with. And the best thing I can do is to put together a book, which is a study, and then through story, try to show people the way that they are and make them aware of it. And And there's a question really quick in the chat room. Um, we refer to you as a demon hunter, so she wants to know what a demon hunter is or does. Basically, I seek out demons. I have a, a website that people can go to. We have a, a Facebook presence, and then we're con- and a phone as well. And they contact us, and we talk with them and find out what's going on. And that's what I mean by a demon hunter. A demonologist just means I study demons. Mm-hmm. All right, so let me. I've got so many questions, but this one just popped into my head. Um, okay, is demon an umbrella term for a whole bunch of different types of entities? 
Well, I would say it's the same entity with a variety of different names. Okay. All right. Yeah, I don't know why I just, you know, because, you know, if you say the devil, you know, you get in your mind devils, you know, but demons, because sometimes they, some elementals are kind of demonic and, and mischievous and whatever. So, you know, I just didn't know if it was kind of more like an elemental or, you know, just in its own genre. Yeah, I would say it's in its own genre, uh, the demonic. And like I said, in different cultures, they have different names. Mm-hmm. And uh, But it's pretty much uh, the same thing. If you go through and actually look at what takes place, the behavior yeah. place, and how it affects people. All right. So the first couple of sentences in the blurb about your book will make most people stop in their tracks because you get straight to the point. No mincing words or sugarcoating, and here's how it goes. It says, demons are real. They roam our world, looking for opportunities to heap destruction upon us. They're ruled by blind hatred towards humanity, and they don't discriminate. Man, woman, or child, all are fair game. Consider this book a fair warning. Now, that's about as hard-hitting as you can get, but before we get into the book, I'm kind of curious as to how your interest in demons came out. Um, I mean, I know you have a lot of other interests, but um, it, it kind of, you wrote that you kind of got into demonology by accident and it, it became your calling. And if that had to do with the Pontiac House, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, what kind of led you up to this? Uh, I was helping out a friend that was having an issue. Like I said, I was a ghost hunter for many years, and I was called in to investigate their house. And through that process, that's how I got introduced to the world of the demon. And I'm not, I am not was not a believer of it at that time. I knew very little about it. Um, I just thought it was maybe ghosts, um, you know, like a, somebody, a, some angry old man that died, and he comes back, and he's still angry <laughs> at death, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, Death does not change your demeanor if you become a ghost. You know, you're the same as you mm-hmm. were in life. Right. So mm-hmm. that's how I got into it. I wasn't looking to get into it. And when I was first introduced into that, we're dealing with a demon. I still thought it was due to psychological reasons of that with the, the individual mm-hmm. that I was dealing with. Yeah, as in exorcism, you know, they always have to check and have a, a psychiatrist do some questions before anything else yeah because our minds do happen to lead in certain directions sometimes yes it's it's very complicated and and uh, there's a lot of gray in there yeah when you're dealing with the demonic well when you're dealing with the metaphysical there's gray i mean you know it's just things that you can't put your finger on and and say for sure but you really kind of know in your mind you know that kind of thing um, another question from the chat room. Have you ever met demons from another culture? Yes. Um, I've met demons uh, from uh, the Hmong culture. Um, there's a big uh, group of them in Detroit. Um, let's see what else. Uh, dr- hmm? Hmm? Oh, um, Arabic. Mm-hmm. The Muslims, yeah. yeah. Um, what's they call the jinn? The The gin, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Same thing. Um, Yeah, there's a Russian and... um, um, I I hear the Japanese have some really nasty demons. Yeah, I haven't come across. We do have a population of Japanese that go to school here at the university, but I've never um, had uh, been called in with the Chinese or or the Japanese at all Mm -hmm. involved in this. Yeah. Um, oh, questions are flying in here. Um, another one: Could thought forms be demons, or are demons a different? You, I guess, because thought forms are what we create. So I guess the question is: Can we create our own demons? Sure. And I mean, they, I, I, yeah, you're talking about the toplas. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, I actually had a ghost case that was a topla. So yeah, it's very real. It's very real. I, I imagine you could create something like that. That's pretty nasty. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> I mean, because yeah. you could, we could inadvertently do that, you know, in, in a rage of anger or something. And then, then yeah. we're, yeah, we're getting yeah. in trouble. And you know what? I found it interesting. Um, 
You said that demons are more inclined to possess the human will and not the body. And I think lots of us thought it was just the other way around. They wanted to possess the body and not the will. Well, maybe the will goes along with the body, but um, it, they're more attuned to – so they, they get in our heads rather than our bodies, right? Right. They use us like puppets. And so the process is to break your will so they can easily take you over – and do what they will, because they don't have much ability to affect our, our world. So they have to do it through us. Mm. So it's a process of usually what they call oppression. I call it harassment, where, you know, sleep deprivation, fear, all these things to control you and break you down so they can easily take over. And and to the point that you don't even, aren't even aware of it. You just all of a sudden have this, you know, lost time. You don't know what happened That to, to that extent. Do they kind of seek out like weak people or certain types of people, um, children maybe? I don't know. Do, I mean, do they have an agenda that um, – because a lot of people have a strong will and that might not be something they're looking at. If they're just looking to be the puppeteer, they would just settle for anybody, wouldn't they? Well, they are predators. And uh, they have their own criteria as far as what people to take or, or to uh, affect. And like uh, a psychic is very open and they're very easy targets for them. So that's something that's uh, um, a lot of my clients are, are psychic to some extent. Uh, people that have mental disorders are targets. People mm -hmm. with sicknesses and stuff are targets. People who call them in will become targets. So you do not have to call them in for them to show up. They're, mm -hmm. they're always out there looking for opportunity to, uh, you know, if you have a, who knows what, a disastrous marriage, things are falling apart, depression and stuff. They see that as an opportunity. Probably people that are addicts and stuff, too. Sure. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Addiction is one of them, too. Yes. Wow. That's what I mean about the gray area is, mm -hmm. is you've got all these other things. The Catholic Church took the stand. Well, if you have a disorder or something of that nature, you know, that's what it is. Well, that's not true. They actually could have demonic in there as well. Mm -hmm. It didn't cause the disorder, but it, 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 it increases it to some extent. Just whatever it can do to make you miserable. Do, do demons procreate? I mean, do they have baby demons and i mean how how is a demon made i have yeah you know it's a very interesting one i had a case down in uh, ohio where there was actually a brother and sister demon and um i have had some that seem to be related as brothers and that kind of stuff but i that's as far as it goes just the way that they, they they talk to each other but beyond that i i don't know but i'm suspicious yes yeah, that they do so but I don't think there's baby demons. It might be like one of those spontaneous things where they're just born, you know, full yeah. body type of thing. I don't maybe just, yeah, maybe they just like generate out of one body and pop in. I mean, yeah, just a kind of a duplication thing. Um, that's scary. <laughs> um, another uh, question from the chat room. Um, how did you learn demon hunting? What? How did you figure all that out and be able to do it well that's basically what the book does um uh, j uh basically uh like i said with my friend i i'm kind of like a anthropologist i'm studying uh the behavior of them mm -hmm. and their culture and from that i start learning how to deal with them and i learn what their weaknesses are and i would use that against them like their egotism their their uh their chaotic attitudes all that type of stuff their mm -hmm. arrogance i use that against them to to give me the uh, upper hand but it was just a long process of watching the behavior and trying different things and then uh with that one case in tennessee that i did was taught me that it is possible to bind a demon and uh and it's really nothing new i mean when you start really looking back you know you got the gin that were you know bound to bottles and uh, thrown into the sea, that type of thing. So it, mm -hmm. it's not anything uh, uh, new. And so through that process, I, I learned trial and error how to do it. 
And mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of how it happened. And it took um, a couple years to get it down to the point where I am now. Uh, and I suppose it's something that you keep learning. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. I, mean, it, I can't observe them directly, but I can observe how they affect the environment. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also have uh, uh, my wife, Dorinda, who's here. She is very critical to this organization, and uh, she will give me a lot of insight, too, as far as, uh, you know, what they're doing, what their behavior is, that type of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a follow-up question. Um, Are there modern-made Nephilim? Um, Because she said there seem to be children who seem to be inherently evil. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't think, I don't know there's such a thing as anything uh, inherently modern. evil. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I, I think, don't, I don't really have an answer for that. Okay. But, you know, she's right. I mean, sometimes, especially when we're, when we're in school, and maybe it's because our attitudes, I mean, we're kids then, but there is always some evil child in your class. Seriously. Yeah. And, you know, and then you look at movies that like The Bad Seed, which is what if in the 1950s, um, you know, that she was evil. And, and I don't know that they were, you know, taken over or anything, but it just seems really that to me that there are people that are evil, but I don't know why, you know, that that's um, in the gray area, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, there are some people that just have an affinity for uh, demons. We've had cases where it's just ongoing and haven't put my finger on exactly why that is, but it does happen. Yeah. Another question from the chat room. You're very popular tonight, Joe. Um, <laughs> what is the most scary, the, the scariest, dangerous demon experience that you had? Well, what I um, normally what I do is I have a variety of clients, like I said, and demons travel in gangs. So you could have like uh, one person has five demons, another person has eight demons, you know, mm-hmm. and on average, it's usually five to ten, somewhere around there. So when I when I do a binding, I summon the demon to myself and then I bind it to an object. And that's when I'm open to attack. Once a demon shows up Mm -hmm. and the um, so what I what I do is I will do multi clients. And so I will do a group of demons, not just ones and twos, but it could be And this one particular time uh, in the book. There's a guy named Steve that I worked with and he left the organization in 2018. So I was backlogged. And I had a lot of people that were suffering I had to take care of. So stupidly, I took on 43 demons at once. Mm. Mm. And it got towards probably the last five or six that they, when they came in, they would attack. They kind of coordinated at that point and and started uh, attacking me to the point that they just drained me of energy. And I couldn't leave the circle because they're waiting for me. And that was probably the scariest part because I didn't know if I was going to come out of that. Wow. Yeah, see, I mean, even thinking about getting face-to-face or, or in, and close to any kind of a demon just is creepy. And then if you're doing it by the numbers, that's, that's even scarier. And you have a chapter in the book on the classification of demons. Um mm-hmm. And in that, you talk about the incubus, the succubus, malevolent ones. But I think some people listening in are not going to sleep too well tonight when they hear about the genocide classification of demons. Um, I don't know. I didn't know that there was a genocide classification. So would you like to expound a little bit on them? Probably one of the most common would be the serial killer. This is a person who has propensity for being a killer, even though they may not do it. And then a demon that would attach themselves to that individual would be enough over a period of time to convince them to kill. And in the book, I describe uh, one of the psychologists I work with. She was uh, 
and forensics and she did a lot with serial killers. So I spent time with her talking about these people and how they just seem to black out and they do this deed, you know, and, and it's just like another individual there. So that would be what, the best way I could describe it. There are some others that are even scarier, but I don't have enough evidence yet to support it. So I'll mm-hmm. just kind of leave that one at that. Okay, another question. Could a person become a demon if they choose to go in that direction, or are demons, you know, just a complete separate entity? It's a complete separate entity. Okay, that's good to know, because <laughs> there might be a lot of people who... Well, really you know, don't... one of the things people don't um, understand is that um, we can't perceive the demon visually. I mean, you may see like um, like a black mist or something like that, but actuality, what we see of the demon is hallucination. So whatever scares you or if maybe it wants to be your friend, you know, to get your trust, it will take mm-hmm. on those forms. Mm-hmm. And the psychics, too, they all have different visions of them, depending. Now, when Dorinda sees them, like during a binding, they'll be horrible things you know maybe half animal half human eyeballs hanging out that kind of thing just Uh horrifying things to her wow yeah i mean i mean the the whole thought of it is is scary i mean mm. but you know what you have a another chapter a whole chapter just on the jinn themselves that we were mentioning a little while ago what separates them from the rest of the demons that gave them their own chapter um, it was, uh, I, I was interested in the, in, in the gen. I didn't know a whole lot about it, but I was suspicious that it was uh, the demon because, you know, the, the roots of the Muslim and Christian and Jewish religions all the same, same root. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, I just um, had the opportunity. I, I wanted to look at the grassroots religion, and that would be you have your formal religion, your scholars, but the grassroots is the people that practice it and what they believe. And so I approached uh, a, mu- a Muslim man that way and through his grandfather that was in Jordan. And from that information, I laid out everything about the demons from their perspective. And then I started comparing them. And in the end, we all agreed that they're the same thing. Mm. Okay. There's a question about um, in the chat room about the best technique for demon attacks, I guess, to, to counteract them. But... Um, those that are their will taken, do they even realize that that they're under demonic power or whatever? Oh, uh, not always, no. But sometimes they would, right? <clears throat> I mean, is is there if like suppose you got one in your head, um, is there a way to get it out on your own, or do you need professional help, or, or what? How does it work? Well, if it got to that point, I don't think you have much luck get, getting rid of it. I mean, it's it's one of those things you'd have to recognize in the beginning. That's the reason for the book, that you might, you know, mm-hmm. be aware of the things. And you start seeing things uh, happening that way, you know, you can stop and, it before it's – because it's a slow process. It's not like, bam, it shows up and, you know, you're possessed. It's not like that at all. Oh, okay. Sometimes it's going to be a period of years. There's uh, demons that I call – uh, generational demons, and they're basic a malevolent classification. And what they do is they might be with your grandparents, and then your parents have them as well, and then your family has them. They just go through the family generation after generation. Oh, geez. We run into a lot of that. Oh, that's, that's creepy. Um, another chat room question. Do demons hate human beings? Or maybe they like them because they can take them over. I don't know. No, they hate them. They're, these things are just reek of hatred. You don't even have to be psychic. And if you walk into a room where a demon lets itself be known, they usually hide themselves. They pretend to be other things. But when they let you know they're there, you can feel the hatred. You could cut it with a knife. Mm. So some of that uncomfortableness sometimes that you walk into a room, you know, someplace that maybe you've never been before and you get that creepy feeling. It could be that. Yeah. Well, it's just like walking into a wall. It is so heavy. Wow. I mean, more so than like a ghost. I mean, it's really, really heavy. Yeah. I mean, you know, getting, being around a a ghost is, is kind of 
interesting and easy, you know, you hair well, stands up on the back of your neck or, you know, I mean, you don't yeah. think it's malevolent usually. And, and, and a ghost is human. I mean, even yeah. though they're ghosts, they're still human. Sure. Yeah. And that's they the way they think of themselves. They don't change. They were and they still are. Yeah. No matter what. Yes. Now, you write about how prevalent demons are in our society outside of religious persuasions. Um, and the book is a compilation of personal stories of your encounters and others. And then um, you get more analytical as you go. And while most things we hear about demons do have a religious connection, whether it be, you know, Hollywood's on screen de depictions or reality TV shows or books or whatever, um, there is always a member of the clergy who tries to exorcise the demon. But this book is mostly outside the context of religion. And, um, you know, my guess is that while the media tells us that all demons cower in the presence of a crucifix and the men of the cloth, I mean, your thought process might have been way um, more that people could relate to when you're writing this book and taking the secular route, right? Yes. The reason I took the secular route is because when you take a religious, whichever one you pick, you have blinders on. You're covered. You have the dogma of, let's say, the Catholic Church, for instance. You have the dogma of them. They have restrictions as far as what reality is. And therefore, if you're going to go out and you're going to take these demons on, you better know everything you can about them. So you can't, you can't put blinders on and only only cherry pick certain things about them. You've got to know everything about them. So that's why it was was secular. Mm -hmm. But most of what we know is heavily dominated by the Catholic Church. They've been dealing with demons for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So the analytical part uh, was more of let's update 600 years of demons up to the you know 21st century. Mm hmm. And we're a lot smarter now about, uh, you know, mental illness and that kind of thing, too, as well. So we hope we are. Sometimes yeah. we wonder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in your experience, I mean, how prevalent are they? Are they like everywhere, <laughs> you know, all the time? Well, it's kind of like when I got into ghost hunting and after a while I realized I couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a ghost. It's like that. <laughs> they're very They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And they watch us and they take the opportunity. And I, that's why I wanted to make people aware of it and give them a way to to combat it as well. Hopefully, you know, people will um, actually tr try to do what I do. Somebody out there. I mean, I have some people now that are starting to do that. So that's good. Yeah, um, it's just it, it's so strange that um, people think like with human ghosts, you know, they think that, okay, well, they're fine. They're around. It's no big deal. Um, but then when you get into the dark arts and people are talking about Satan and all those other things and ears prick up a little bit. And, you know, it, if they're around all the time, I mean, that's kind of a scary thought, you know, I mean, it, it, it kind of wants, and maybe this is part of the reason of the book that um, you want to bolster people's, knowledge in order for them not to get preyed on right yeah i mean uh the be aware of it absolutely yeah yeah it, it's um yeah it's really scary um another chat room question have you ever been in mortal danger of physically or or have been physically hurt after being in contact with the demon yes i have I've had cracked ribs, bruises, bites, clawed, um, about broke my neck. Um, Ouch. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they attacked you because they didn't like what you were doing, right? Right. When, 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 you, when you call them in, uh, when you summon them, and they figure out what's going on. I like the demons that don't have a clue I'm coming. Those are, those are the good ones that are easy to take out. <laughs> But the ones that know and they, and they plan, those are the worst. And I'll get tacked before I even be able to get set up. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, but see, if you like your psychic and say a demon scratches you, mm -hmm. usually it would appear immediately and you'd have all of the pain associated with it. But with me, it would take several hours before it would show up. And all of a sudden, all these bruises and scratch marks and bite marks would just show up on my body. And then after a matter of hours, then they would dissipate. 
Mm. So, like, <clears throat> how do they crack ribs? I mean, they're they're not physical beings, but how? What? Sometimes they can, and I don't yeah. know why. Sometimes they're intangible, and sometimes they're not. Oh, I mean, I look in quantum physics, and that kind of gives me a clue to what's going on. But, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it is kind of in the, in the realm of possibility. But I just can say that there's times um, that they can have a very much a physical effect on you. Yeah, I mean, spirit can too, and it's kind of the same thing. You know, if you get some angry spirit, I mean, they'll smack you or push you down the stairs or something, and they don't have a real body either. So maybe it's kind of that same thing. Yeah, I mean, I've had a ghost once. I was just sitting in a parlor, and I had a bunch of psychologists at this haunted house. And I said, okay, I'll just keep a night vigil. And there was a woman that haunted the parlor, and I was sitting there, and I fell asleep, and then I felt a hand on my ankle, moving my ankle, you know, because I had my legs crossed. And I thought mm-hmm. one of the psychologists had come down, and it was it was a ghost. And I could open my <laughs> eyes, and it was, you know, she was waking me up. You're supposed to be watching out for things, you know. So, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, it that can be makes- very physical. All right. Well, um, we're at the half at halfway point, so we're going to take a very quick break. So everybody hang in there, and we will be right back. Stirring the Cauldron will be right back, so don't go away. If you end up with web feet, remember, you've been warned. Throughout time, events have occurred that have shaped human history. Spirit voices from the past have many stories to tell, and... For the past several years, channelers Barry and Connie Strom have been conducting live channeling sessions and relaying those stories and messages from those on the other side. We invite you to tune in to Barry and Connie's new show, Channeling History, on the Para-X Radio Network, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, as they relay the messages of those voices from the past. The ones who have witnessed history firsthand, and those who have made history themselves. Hi, this is Marla Brooks from Stirring the Cauldron. One of the best gifts that you can give yourself or to someone else on your Christmas list this holiday season is the gift of insight. And if your crystal ball is a bit murky, think about giving them or yourself a personalized yearly Witch's Oracle Deck reading. This comprehensive reading gives you a heads up on what the universe has in store for you in the coming year, and the month-to-month guide offers you a chance to make necessary changes if need be, before situations get out of hand, or give you a hint of something really good to look forward to. So if you want to treat yourself or someone else, Pop over to MarlaBrooks.com, click on the More tab on the homepage menu, and then click on Readings to find out more. And have a very happy holiday season, and blessed be. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And yes, we are back, and my guest tonight is Joseph Stewart, and he's the author of Demons, and um, I mentioned the Pontiac House before the break, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, but a really interesting question came in from the chat room, so I'm going to ask that first. Um, Besides banishing a demon from a person, can a demon be hurt or injured in any way? Um, I'm not banishing a demon in the sense of the word. I'm actually binding a demon. I'm summoning it to myself, and then I bind it into an inanimate object, like the, uh, the genie in the bottle. <clears throat> um, not that I know of. I would not have any way to do that since they're intangible, but I can bind them. So they, because they're not kind of living really like we are, you can't kill them. Um, but all right. So what do you do? Okay. So you have all these, um, demons bound in Mm -hmm. objects. Now, what do you do with the objects? Well, just like they did in ancient times, they end up at the bottom of lakes and oceans and buried deep somewhere in the wilderness and no one ever find them. And even if people did find them, they would not be able to resurrect them. No, because they, yeah, because I make them very inert. So they're just like, um, 
just like a lump of coal. There, there's no mental activity, nothing. Wow. Does that? I, I, I bet it takes a lot out of you um, mentally to do this, and physically too, probably. Yes, it can be very draining. Usually it runs in like a three-day spurt where you're very drained um, of energy because they do feed them biophysical energy mm-hmm. and, and whatever else they, they manage to do to you. Like strangling you, that's always fun. Mm-hmm. They don't want you to complete your uh, um, the prayers or whatever you're doing and they will strangle you so you can't talk. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and so there's a question about binding. Is binding like in like the Dybbuk, Dib, I, it, yeah, Dybbuk box. Yeah, I know what you're saying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, you're just basically taking the spirit. But in that case, usually the spirit is very active. So once you open the container like Pandora's box, you let it out. This isn't the same way. That's why I make them inert. That's amazing. I mean, I've never heard of that happening. I've heard of, of binding, obviously, um, and things. But to make them inert, that's interesting. It's, it's well, remember, uh, the control of the demon, you have to have their name. Once you have their name, it's almost like a computer program. You have their name, and then you give a command. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can command them to become inert, that their, their thought processes totally stop. And mm-hmm. at the moment that I bind that demon, that demon is out of that person's environment. It could be on the other side of the world. It makes no difference. When I call them, they come. And then I bind them. They're gone out of the person's environment. Total change on everything. Do they willingly give you their names? No. That's How one. Of the, well, one of the functions that my wife Dorinda does is she's uh, she's been trained in being what I call a demon dowser. She can <laughs> come up with the names of these demons, and then that's what I use to call them in. Now, occasionally, I do come up with names. I think it's mainly because. I've had so much physical contact with the world and stuff. Occasionally, it does does come to me. Mm-hmm. And and in the book, I mean, you know, some people think that demons can easily be banished by exorcism or prayer. Um, some people say they can't be banished at all. But you've developed a new technique of binding demons. And um, the question in the chat room is, how do you make them inert? I tell them that they're inert. I give them the command that your all your thought processes are stopped. You have become inert, and that's what I tell them. And they obey me. They have to obey me. Once wow. you have their name, you have total control. Total. Mm. That's yeah, why I but... give out names and things. Is I don't want anybody to resurrect a demon and start using it for their own purposes. Got to tell you, it's a bad thing to do, and you're going to lose. <laughs> well, some people are, you know, still looking for the one in the Ouija board. Um... <laughs> But that's, you know, that's a whole nother story. All right. So tell us about the Pontiac house. Um, I would say that's probably the uh, where I became convinced that there was this thing as a demon. Mm -hmm. And the first demon I ever worked with was an incubus. And the incubuses are extremely smart. Mm. Uh, They understand our culture very well. Everything Mm -hmm. about our culture and about human sexuality and all that. And that's, that's what it's, that's what its major function is, is to draw on that sexual energy. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, these people I was working with uh, that uh, were in my area here in Michigan, uh, the, the woman that was attacked owned a home in Pontiac and that is the lair of an incubus. You kind of look at it this way that an incubus to me, is like a spider it has this web of women that it connected to. Once it makes that connection, it can come to you anywhere in the world, and that's what it does. And it goes to them and feeds on them. I've done about 18 of these things over the last four years. And uh, the, the, th- the best thing about these is once I take an incubus out, I could free up to 35, 40 women. I may not even know who they are, but these are all their victims. They're immediately freed, it, you know. So that, that, that's the good thing about that. But so anyways, uh, yeah, I uh, was told to go in and do an investigation to find out the woman had the house up for sale. And I, I said, sure, I'll go in and do that. And I was going to go in on my own the following Saturday. This was in uh, 2016, I think. Mm-hmm. And I just uh, thought, you know, something. I just had this gut feeling like, don't do it. You, you need to have somebody with you. 
And mm-hmm. so I called up a psychic friend of mine I've worked with before. She's very good as a medium. And uh, we just uh, get to this house and we have all these delays. The door keeps relocking after we unlock it and all kinds of things going on. She knew where the place was and she got lost in the city. She was in a fog and just took forever to get herself together and into this home. Mm. So during the process, when she comes in, I like I said, demons don't let themselves be known. They remain hidden. And so when she walked into the environment, she said, there is something here, but I don't know what it is. I don't think it's a ghost, but I, I don't know what it is. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's veiled. Mm-hmm. So we started the process. Now, my friend gave me this, uh, he was concerned about me. And he gave me this, this big 14-inch uh, iron crucifix, mm-hmm. twisted steel. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I gave that to her, and she had it on the palm of her hand, and I was videotaping, and we go up, and I was doing EVPs, and, you know, anybody that's a ghost hunter, they know that. If there's ghosts, they're mm-hmm. busy bodies, they're going to say something, so you're going to get something. I got absolutely nothing. Just nothing was being picked up at all. So then we uh, went into the uh, the bedroom where this lady was, and this thing would attack from the ceiling while the woman was asleep, and just create all this terror and stuff, and then it would uh, eventually... Uh, take her over and the psychic was picking up on all this stuff and I never told her anything about it. So at some point it started talking and I'm walking down the uh, upper, I was in the upper floors with her looking into the other bedrooms and she turned to me and said, that cross, the crucifix and the holy water is not going to help you. And I'm like, what did you just say? And she's, what are you talking about? You just told me the cross and the holy water. I said, I didn't say that. So that's kind of how it started. Mm. And so then she started she started um, having an interaction with it. It started talking. And uh, we went back into the bedroom where she was, and, and she had the crucifix laying in the palm of her hand while she's sensing the room. And she says, I said, you know, I says, this really sounds like an incubus. And when I said that, you could feel feel the energy spike in the room and the iron fist of the Christ figure snapped off and dropped to the floor. Mm. And I mean, this is one solid piece of iron. Yeah. And, uh, and then she started yelling. She says, it, no, it it, it can't believe it. It can't believe it. And I said, can't believe what? He said, I can't believe that you figured out it was an incubus. It's going to kill you where you stand. And so she's, she's trying to control it. And I could see at some point I started seeing another face, you know, on top of hers, some Mm -hmm. strange twisted thing. And I, and I backed up and she said, it's going to, it's going to try to throw you off the railing down to the floor below. Well, actually what I thought was going to happen is that, that, that crucifix make, would make a nice dagger because you got about three eighths of an inch uh, long end on it that you could literally stab somebody with. And Mm -hmm. later on, she did uh, relate to me. That's really what the plan was. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of diffused it. I said, look, we're not here to harm you. You know, we're just here to do for a friend, you know. And then I got very talkative. And I said, hey, uh, I want you guys to go into the basement. I got something to show you. And I'm like, no, 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 we're not going down there. (laughs) And the lady's kind of getting, the woman's getting really influenced by this thing. I could tell. And, um so we, we finally, um, there's, there's a lot more involved, but just the highlights here. We finally get down t- uh, to the main floor, and I, 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 I'm getting really nervous. I'm thinking, like, this, this is really, you know, above our pay grade. We need to really get out of here. And uh, she agreed, and we were going to go out the front door, and I kept wanting to go to the back door. I kept walking there, and I was realized I was being manipulated, now, the back door, there's a landing where's the stair that goes to the basement. And that's where it was trying to get me to go. So I see this, like, white material, putty-like material on the doorknob. And I said, what the hell is that? That was never there before. So I take my camera and I zoom in on it and I can't focus on it. So I take the camera and I focus to other things in the kitchen and it focuses fine, but I can't focus on that. But I, So I'd have to go investigate it, which I wasn't going to do. So the next thing I know, she comes walking by me like in a trance. And she mm. walks right to that landing and steps down 
and I ran up to her. I'm yelling at her, but she doesn't seem to be hearing me. And I run up to her, and that's when I see this black swirling mist that takes on the form of this huge, what we call black shuck, like of the British Isles, the black dogs with the red eyes. And this thing started bounding up the stairs. I mean, the stairs were creaking. You could hear it breathing. You could smell the foul breath. And I don't know if she tripped or fainted, but she started falling downstairs right at this thing. And I was able to get her by the collar and pull her back into the kitchen. It took her, and it kind of, that stopped right there at that point. It took her a few minutes to get her senses about her. And she was all upset. She said, that is one of the things I have the greatest fear of is the, the black shucks, the black dogs of, of uh, the British Isles. Mm-hmm. And it said it knew, and it knew that fear, and it took on that form. So, I mean, this was a hallucination. It was a shared hallucination. And, I mean, it was, I mean, the weight, the smells, the whole nine yards was there. Mm. So, at that point, uh, we were able to get out of the house, and uh, the thing kept affecting the environment as we got further and further away. So, that's kind of how I... Uh, well, at that point, I realized this thing is for real. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> couldn't think much else. Um, now, you've got an experiment in the book that relates to knowing a demon's name to con- gain control over them. Um, I mean, you have all kinds of neat things in the book. I mean, not neat things, but, you know, handy tips and, and whatever. Um, but, okay, so you have the experiment of how to do it you're telling somebody how to gain control get the name but um i i would suggest that people not do that just to see if it works right yeah it was it was more or less for the uh, catholic priests because they use the uh the person that's under attack to get the names of the demon you know they go through this process right and i mean sometimes it's in drag out for years it's not very efficient and um so I was wondering, I said, can we name a demon to get him to accept that name and then bind it? And that was the, the experiment. Mm. So I had a woman, um, she was Hmong, that was having a lot of demonic issues. And there was one main demon. And I said, I need you to pick out the demon that's the leader, the one that is talking to you the most. And I randomly grabbed a name and I gave her that name. And I says, I want you to start calling it that name. Do not contact me. Do not Think about me. I will contact you at a certain point. And so from that point on, she started calling the demon by the name. And it got really ticked about it. And said, that's not my name. You know, she says, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's your name. So after a while, um, the threat of me was gone. It didn't see me as a threat. And she kept doing it. Nothing happened to it. So after a while, it accepted the name. Hmm. And so at that point, which was about six weeks in, I summoned the demon and it showed up and it said to me, what do you think I am? Some pet you can call? And I said, well, here you are. And I bound it. So it did work. I did it four times. It does work. Wow. Very so cool. Just, that's, that's for the priest out there to maybe help things along. Yeah. Now, some of the illustrations in the book are rather thought provoking and not in a good way. Um, <laughs> You know, like the peeper demon pushing his face through the wall to peep at a woman who lived there while she was in the shower. Yeah. Or the incubus demon who summoned a hellhound to attack you and the psychic in the Pontiac house. Yeah. Um, that must have, you know, that must have been scary. Oh, yeah, it was scary. You know, hellhounds are very, I mean, everybody knows who the hellhounds are and they're they're not very friendly. Um do you think modern day humanity has given the demon perfect to hunting ground? Uh, I do. I think today it's uh, more so than ever. Just because of the times? I mean, okay, so here, here another question to that. Are they the ones that are making our world so bad? Well, I, in all honesty, I believe if we were able to detach ourselves from demons completely, I would think we'd have less wars, less murders, and less suicides. I really believe that. Mm-hmm. I've seen what they do to people. But how do we, I mean, how, I mean, okay, there are a lot of people that don't believe in demons. They don't believe in spirits, you know, ghosts, anything like that. But then, you know, um, again, let's take it away from the secular for a minute. 
but the religion is never going to let people forget that there are demons, right? Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on uh, I guess it depends on uh, the religion because some religions uh, utilize demons. They do. Yeah, Muslims use them for healing purposes. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, the, yeah. Yeah, but when the bill comes due, that's when things go south. When they yeah, you get nothing for free in this world. <clears throat> but yeah, the the environment is very much so. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, religion doesn't have as much of a stronghold as it used to be. Mm. Uh, but um, the Catholics very much so are, are very much aware of it. But unfortunately, um, they really haven't done much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because a lot of my clients are Catholic and they go to the priest and they refuse to do any kind of an exorcism where it's a very politically red tape thing that takes forever. And some of these situations, these people need help now, not a year from now, not two years from now. So. You know, every diocese is supposed to have an exorcist, mm-hmm. every one of them. But a lot of dioceses will not utilize those exorcists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I guess, you know, out of thought, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind sometimes, you know. And uh, that's probably kidding yourself because what's there is there. If you believe that they're there or, or if you don't, well, you might miss out on some of the fun. I don't know. You know, it, it's... It's a topic, like you said, there's this big gray area, but there is a lot of talk about it. I mean, if thing, if it wasn't um, something, if it was something that people would just kind of poo poo and think it was nothing. I mean, why is Hollywood making a lot of money on demon movies? You know, there's a lot of fiction books on demon movies and, you know, where there's smoke, there's there's flame, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the demons in general do not want you to believe in them. Because if you don't believe in them, they can get away with everything. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't even have a clue. Yeah, that's true. And it, it's just kind of, hmm. In Hollywood's Hollywood, you know, they got to, you know, they got to sell a movie and they got to make it good, you know. Well, I'm sure demons would be really happy about that, you know. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, most some... people walk around thinking there's only one demon involved, you know, but that's not it at all. There's many involved. Well, so there's a difference between a devil and a demon, yeah? I don't recognize a devil. I don't know really what that means. It means different things for different people. Well, true. Fallen angels or, you know, Lucifer was a fallen angel kind of thing. Yeah, that's an origin story of the Christians, yeah. Mm -hmm, The Muslims, Muslims, the jinn, were on this earth before mankind was. Mm-hmm. And they they uh, they were a warring race. They're always fighting and always chaos. And man replaced them, mm-hmm. and they were moved off into another dimension, kind of thing. Very interesting story. I go into it a little bit in the book. Yeah, well, I mean, there there is so much in the book. Um, what I mean, you, you don't have to read it cover to cover. I mean, you know, you can take bits and pieces, um, you know, but you should read it cover to cover. But um, what do you think the strongest point in your book is as far as helping people to stay out of trouble? That demons are real and they are here with us now. Be aware of them. Be positive, happy. They hate that. And it's very difficult to attack people when they're extremely positive. Mm-hmm. Depression, all that negativity, addiction, and it's that's prevalent in our culture right now. It is. And, you know, you wonder how do we get around that? I mean, even without demons, I mean, how does one change the world? Because the world is is kind of in a tailspin, going negative. People are going negative. Um, There's not a whole lot of things to do cartwheels about, you know. So I guess you'd have to do it from an individual perspective. Each person has to, uh, you know, take control and, uh, you know, and discipline and, uh, you know, themselves and uh, make a better life for themselves. If everybody did that, the world would be that way. Yeah. But, you know, as human beings, we have a way of being really good at shooting ourselves in the foot. (laughs) Yes, we are. (laughs) And so that kind of, you know, I mean, you, you have to have evil if you have good. 
You have to have light if there is dark. I mean, it, it, it's a duality. You can't get away with it. Everything has an opposite. But sometimes, you know, and especially in these times when things are just kind of junky and, and miserable, you know, it's hard to find the, rain, the, the sun at the end of the rainbow or the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow or even the rainbow, you know. So this is probably a very, very good hunting ground now for not only demons, but, um, you know, um, regular um, angry spirits. You know, they're probably enjoying it a little bit, too, don't you think? Yeah, there's uh, all kinds of things out there. I'm sure that they would be. Yeah. Well, tell everybody, because we, I mean, we could go on for another full hour talking about this, but sometimes time itself is a little demonic and <laughs> we have to get going. So before we do, give out your website information so people can find out more about you and your books and what you may be up to. Okay, uh, the website is all one word, Society of Demonologists, with an S, dot org. And if they put in a request there, it will get to us, and then we will contact them. Um, we usually go to the people's homes and things like that, but because of the COVID and stuff, we've been able to do things remotely very successfully. We've worked overseas in Scotland and England and uh, South America, and we've been very successful at that. So at yeah. this point, distance doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. It's the will that takes over, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and well, you know, even in witchcraft, if we're doing a spell, you know, it's the will and the intention that makes it happen. Yeah, we got we got to get out of that three dimensional thinking, you know, and that geographic thinking that's beyond all that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've said this a thousand times and people are going to say, here she goes again. But it's not a good thing to live in the black and white when the gray area is the place of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Like and you've got a you've got a Facebook page too, right? Yes, I think it's okay. uh, Michigan Society of Demonologists. We have people that contact us there as well. Mm -hmm. You're easily easy to be found, and the book is easy to get, and it is uh, very interesting. And, and and like I said, beautiful. I'm I know that's just the looks, but it's just as good inside as it is looking on the outside. But, yeah, it, it's definitely something that, that is a good read and, and probably a necessary one for a lot of people. Yes, I hope it wakes a lot of people up or at least makes thing, make them aware of things that are going on. Yeah, yeah, just, let, you know, right, put down the wall, go into the gray area, just listen. And sometimes that, that helps a lot. So thank you for joining me tonight. And please come back again at some point. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody who's listening in as well. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more fun. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2009. You have been listening to the Para-X Radio Network. 